Uh, you said you could, you were drafted, is that correct? That's right. Uh, could you, well, first of all, what was it like getting that letter? Yeah. you remember your reaction to it? Well, I knew I was going to be getting it, but it was no surprise. Yeah. Uh, because we had, the United States had already gone to the war, and so the draft was being instituted. So uh, I knew it would be coming sooner or later. So you said there were three different levels you could choose as a conscientious objector. Yes. And this was before I had anything to do with the Army, uh, before I had made any papers or applications. A, a person who wanted to become a conscientious objector had an opportunity to, to go in at three different levels. The first being uh, to be in the Army uh, and be drafted and say it's a 1A O, meaning one, I was one classified 1A, but O being objector. Uh, the second would be I could, I could, uh, I'll have the interview with the, with the, with the recruiting, with the uh, draft board, and if I would be accepted as a conscientious objector, I could, I could then go into some sort of a, a, a service that's approved by the, uh, by the government for for objection, which was the hospital or some other kind of facility like this, uh, and the the highest level, highest level, uh, was that I would not participate in any way with the government about the war, which means I would not make a, I would not become a, uh, I would not register as as a for the draft. I wouldn't participate in any way with them. Uh, and then they would then bring charges against me and not to be sent to prison. Uh, so you, one of the things you said was you had uh, gone to uh, Laurel Camp, a Methodist camp, yeah. and uh, had heard uh, a few speakers, G. Bromley Oxnum and uh, Harold Case. What was it about their speaking to, to the camp? What was it that impressed upon you that you wanted to be a conscientious objector? Well, uh, I think I would say that what it did it gave me um, more impetus to move on, and uh, that I had, had in my own mind become a conscientious objector before actually meeting them. Uh, it just they were, gave me continued support to what I was being doing. G. Bromley Oxfam was, was, the, was the Pope. Was the, was the bishop of the Methodist Church. His office was in Boston. Uh, and he was a very eloquent speaker. Uh, and uh, I don't recall, I don't recall, I remember going to Worcester once and to hear him speak, uh, which was something that was sponsored by our group, a Methodist group in, in New England at the time. Uh, and uh, I was most impressed with it, with his speaking, his, his eloquence. Uh, but uh, I believe what it was, he talked about how he came to be uh, an, uh, uh, a uh, yeah, opposed to war. Uh, and uh, so that I was very comfortable with, with what he was saying. And uh, it just added, added more impetus to me to take in that position. Now, Harold Case was a different, different story because I was seven days at the camp. Uh, and he was the other seven days. And he was the evening speaker every one of those days. Uh, and he, uh, he too talked about his position as uh, being uh, a... Uh, Conscious objector. So he was also conscientious. Yes, he uh, later was became the, the president of uh, Boston University. At that time, Boston University was, was started by the Methodists, and uh, so up until I maybe who was the last one, any president of the university had to be a Methodist minister, and he was a Methodist minister in in. Uh, what's, what's the steel center of Pennsylvania? 
Pardon? Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. No, it wasn't. But it, it, it was anyway. He was a Methodist minister in in, uh, in uh, Pennsylvania when he came to speak to us at Laurel Park. Um, so I think it was a matter of their philosophy and, and how they and how the church uh, influenced them to become a church. Was something that was very compatible with my thinking and just an encouragement to go on with it. Were there other people who were uh, at the camp with you who also became conscientious objectors? Not that I know. Not that you know. Did you have, did, were there any of friends of yours who were conscientious No. Objectors? I found out later on there was somebody who should have been. A very, very sad story. Someone who was in our youth group at the Methodist Church in, in, in New Springfield. Uh, he when it was, was drafted the same day I was. Uh, and he, my mother told me the story because she knew his mother. And his mother came down to the railroad station when, uh, when we all left off, got on the train to go to Fort Devens. And it's a very sad story. She said that he broke down with his mother, he was crying. And he said, I don't want to go, I don't want to go. And he said to her, please don't send me, mother. And he was killed. And I thought after this, how tragic that the, this woman carried that. You know, it wasn't her fault that he went, but you know, he, he in a sense laid it on her. Uh, and I thought to myself, he, he could, with the prime subject, I should have talked with him. Because I could, he certainly would have become a conscientious objector. Um, oh, do you remember so, his name? Yes. I, Jack. John. That wasn't John Ward, what was it? It'll come to me. Okay. Was it Jack Ward? Hmm? No. No? There was something in your journal about a Jack Ward. Was there? Well, maybe it was a word. Okay. Um, well, I think we left off. Um, we were talking about, uh, I mean, you were in Europe for quite a long period of time. And you were in, um, you saw the Battle of the Bulge. Right? Yes. So you were there. Yes. And you started to tell me uh, the Battle of the Bulge began, I think, December 16th? 17th, I think. 17th. Exactly. So you were there, you were, you were with that... With my 78th version before, before the war started, but before the war, before the Battle of the Bulge started. Mm -hmm. So... And what, what we, were, you, we yeah. were at the front where the Battle of the Bulge started. It started near us and then south of us. Uh, and they tried... They tried to push us back to it, that they were going to go through through our division. And they weren't able to do it because we had, we were about, we were getting ready to go in the capture of dam in Germany. And in order to do this, the military felt that we needed additional support for our division. So that we had a tank corps, a uh, the second ranger battalion, uh, a variety of, uh, of other units that were separate units that were attached to ours for this assault. And so when they attacked us, we were able to repel their, their attack because of the support that we had in our preparation to attack them. Did you see a lot of casualties there? Pardon? Did you see a lot of casualties? Yes, yes. We, we went into action on Friday the 13th. Uh, and uh, we knew exactly when they were going to start it. It was going to be six o'clock in the morning. And so that we were all prepared, our ambulance drivers or whether they were ambulances, and all of us were ready to go and do what we needed to do. Um, and then gradually, and then very shortly after the time they were, to the begin, they were to begin, we started getting casualties. So we had a lot of casualties that first day. 
happen? Did you have to carry people? Yeah, yeah. Uh, what what we did for that first day, they wanted us to stay at the collecting station, so that when the ambulances arrived with with a, they could put four stretchers in an ambulance, and every time they arrived, we were going to get them out of the ambulance and brought them in to where the, and then. Some of us, as I did, I prefer, uh, performed first aid because there were so many of them. The doctor, we had, didn't have enough doctors to all handle all more. So there was a triage that we had to go through. I remember one doctor, one officer that I worked on. He, he had actually, he was with an infantry unit. And I met him. Uh, on either the boat or in New York before we left. Uh, and I remember he wasn't <laughs> very appreciated by the troops. He was a, you know, a, a, a GI, as, as before to someone who really was doing everything by the books. Um, and what happened was he, he had been wounded in his upper arm and his shoulder, and it was a gaping hole. And I remember I I, I was able to, to stop the bleeding and I uh, put on sulfothiazone. So we had a powder in a, in a packet that we had. We had a lot of these in our bag so that we could sprinkle this on an open wound. It was an anti, it was a sulfur, sulfur drug. And, and I must have been, I must have been really hurt. And I apologized. And he said, no, no, it's okay, it's all right. <laughs> it's not falling on and he said, uh, So it was, it was just, we had to do a lot of that. What else do you remember about the, uh, that, that battle? About what? The Battle of the Bulge. Oh. Do you have other memories of that time? Uh, well, we were on we were on the border of the island, with the northern border of the bulge, and uh, as I said, we really didn't see much action at this time because we were in a holding action, and uh, the the Germans were not interested. Once they realized that they couldn't get through where we were, they were a part of the group that went south of us, and so they really didn't inflict many casualties on us at the time. It was later that we had more. Okay. So what was your, after after that, where, where did you go after that? Um, well, we stayed where we were during the bulge. And then uh, one night, uh, our commanding officer, officer for our, our company told us that he had just gotten a call from the 311th Infantry Regiment. Uh, that they needed some help, that they were having a special action where the, the men in the 78th were going to, 3rd, 3rd, 11th, were going to be going through the German lines towards our objective. And uh, I think they were going to be going up about 8, 9 o'clock at night. This is mid-December, so it was, it was a long night at that time. Um, and he needed some help. He needed 12 men to come, to go as special litter bearers to, to pick up where the men were, were hit, dropped, and then to move them from there to the aid station, which is further back from the actual uh, front. And uh, I think this is, I'm repeating myself on some of these things. Uh, but I, we had a situation where one of the men of our 12 that were selected to go suddenly developed diarrhea and vomiting. And um, so he couldn't go with us. And we all knew what it was. He was sick. He was not sick. He was, he, he was afraid to go. And uh, he effectively hoodwinked the officers and, and he stayed back. And the thing that I found so interesting, 
uh, that all, all 11 of us that were left uh, knew that he was afraid that this is the reason he wasn't going on. And yet none of us ever said anything, either with each other, we didn't talk about it, and we certainly didn't talk to him about it. Uh, but it was always, always hush-hush. So we understood how we could see it free. We weren't, but, and I guess we gave him that privilege. Uh, but we just didn't, didn't respond to it in any way. And that, that episode, that night, is one for which we got the Bronze Star. Um, because it was very unusual. It was, it's just, and, uh, and this is, it's just, it was, it was the end of January, so it was very cold. It was, it was cold, it was raining, it was freezing, uh, and we had the long, we had these long halls to go from where they were hit back to the aid station. And we were using a dirt road, a small dirt road. And I guess I told it to two about stepping on the landline. Um, and as we were going out, going to, to the, where the aid men were, uh, we heard someone calling for help. And so I said to them, uh, I'll go to here and then some of you come back and we'll, we'll take them back. So I went out and as I started to go out, the, the German was started shooting their machine gunners. And fortunately there was sort of a little rise where the road was. And so we were a little higher than where he was. And so his he was not able to aim his gun he aimed at us, but he just wasn't able to hit us, fortunately. <laughs> um, and I got out to him. You want me to tell the story again? Uh, and he was crying for his mother. And we had had this experience earlier in the United States when we went to our maneuvers once, where a, a, a truck, an American truck, pulling a, 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 a small uh, artillery piece. So his trailer was, and he got going so fast that the trailer started wiggling back and forth and turned the whole truck over, up, upside down, off the road. And so many of them, there were several troops inside the truck. So they were trapped under, in, with this truck that's, and collapsed over him then. And I, the crazy thing was that there was a side of a road, it was on a little hill too, and there was a, a brook running alongside the road. And some of the men actually drowned. And they were trapped underneath this truck from the water. Because we were unable to get, we, there's no way we'd get this truck up. We had where, to, where was this? This was in Tennessee. Oh. And I remember at that time, men calling for their mother. Oh. I remember at this time, no. I was I was only 18 or 19 years old. And so I'm sure that some other guys in there are probably a similar age. Uh, so it, it was, it was very sad. Anyway, back to the German. Back to, so this was in, was this, what, this was Kesternick? K E S T E R N E C K. Okay. Okay. So now after Kesternick, and that's where you got your bronze bronze medal for the uh, carrying those men. Out. Yeah. Um, and you did tell me that's that, that story. So, um, and that's also where there was a German, right, who was calling for help. That, that's after I that after. after I worked on our man and got him right. I, I cut off part of his boot, and he had been hit in the leg, and so I stopped the bleeding with compress bandage over the hand, and I gave him a shot of morphine, and then a couple, one of them, my comrades, came back with with a litter, and so 
we put them on a litter and we started to bring them out. And this again is when not, we didn't hear anything from the chairman at that time. And there, there was no fire in the gun. It was only when I was going across the field that he was firing at me. Uh, so after we disposed of, disposed of him at the aid station, we then went back to get some more wounded. And as we were going down the road again, this German evidently had been hit by an American. Uh, and so he was wounded and he was calling comrade for help. Uh, now, we were carrying our own, we weren't able to go to provide help for him. We'd have to come back later. Uh, and we never heard anything more from him. I don't know whether he, someone else had brought him back uh, or whether he died or whether what happened. So after after that, the Battle of the Bulge, now where did you go after that? Uh, our next job was, was capturing that dam. And this dam had backed up a huge lake. Uh, and this thing was a the Roar, R O E R, Roar River. And the significance of the dam was that this dam held all these all this water from this from the dam. And they could blow the dam anytime they wanted to to flood the plains to the northwest, because this is a river that flowed north. It went run up through Germany and then into Holland and it entered the ocean in Holland. Uh, and so, since they controlled the dam and the flow of the water, they, at any time that, that our first army, or the British army, tried to cross this river, they could blow up the dam and flood them out. Uh, and so they had to capture that before they were felt free to be able to cross the river. And so, it was, it was, it was bitter fighting. We suffered a lot of casualties. And also, we had to take their pillboxes because the Siegfried Line was right on the German border with Belgium and Holland and, and France. I don't know if there was anything that went home, but. And so uh, it was tough, and we had a lot of casualties that time. But we finally did capture the dam. And, and then after that, uh, and I think probably what happened with the German forces that there was a lot of morale that we really pummeled. Once that we were in a Germany, now the German forces had been pushed through France and Belgium, and now that we were in Germany. And I think for many of them, they thought the war's over. You know, they can't. We can't stop them now. Uh, and so the fighting was not as, as nearly as heavy during the plains when the after the capture of the dam and on our way to the Rhine River. Uh, and so, so hey, we, we didn't have that many casualties. And this one I would do, occasionally I would go on some of my excursions you know, over the countryside. Now, I, I, we heard a rumor that, that they were going, because of our involvement in the dam, we were going to get a few days off as a division. Uh, and so we we're coasting along across the plains towards the Rhine. And just then, the, the, our units are 78th Division and the 9th Armored Division captured uh, the Ludendorff Bridge over the Rhine River. Now, every bridge over the Rhine had been demolished by the Germans so that the, we couldn't cross into Germany. Uh, and this one, for some reason, they screwed it up and they didn't bomb it. They didn't blow it up. Uh, and the units from the 9th and the 78th captured the bridge and their engineers got over and, it dis and cut the wires so it couldn't be blown up. Uh, and they had all the troops that, that were in that area, those of us in the 78 that weren't a part of the capturing, we were all told we've got to get that get across that bridge. Uh, and so we just drove till we got to the bridge. Uh, and for us, well, 
was when we had to go fast, we all rode in our, in our ambulances. And so I crossed the bridge on the, on the ambulance. <laughs> uh, I have some pictures of, and I took, I was actually crossing the bridge. And then I have another picture I can show you to you later. I, I have it, uh, that on my computer now, um, of the bridge. I took a picture of the bridge from the, from the eastern side, the German side. Uh, and it was much later that they, they finally, because of repeated attacks by the German Air Force, uh, the, the bridge did collapse finally. But by that time, we had a whole bunch of pontoon bridges along the Rhine that were set up to carry the traffic. What came next? Well, uh, where, where's Remagen? Remagen is, um, it's, <laughs> it's, oh, I don't know how many miles. I mean, in, in the time frame, are we, is that yeah. what came next? Well, we ran across the plain, and then we went across the Romagin. Uh, and now what was happening is that, because now troops are pouring over the Rhine in different areas. Uh, and Montgomery, for the English forces, uh, there were divisions up there north of us, uh, English divisions, and then there were some also American divisions that were in the, in the Ninth Army. Uh, and those two had already crossed. So now it was going to be a rat race. Uh, and tremendous efforts were made to get all these troops. And what, the, what our echelon had planned was they were going to encircle the, the German forces. So the English forces and of our American division, the Ninth, Ninth Army, were north of us. They started moving eastward, and we were a part of the first of the first army. We were going towards east also, but there was some distance between where we were, and there were a lot of German forces there. And so, what actually happened was that we met up with the other our other American forces north of us, and and made a big, huge pocket. It was the R U H R, the Ruhr industrial area. Uh, and I had pictures of thousands of troops that that we captured, and there was I remember one. I'll show you the picture. It's a picture I took of the mass of men. There's an American chief with a machine gun. It's all loaded there. Really. No one's there because there's no the Germans were had had enough war, and the war was over for them. They weren't going to escape. What were they going to escape to? So uh, security for these forces was very was not necessary at all. They just were. So when we, after this was happening, we ended up in a Wuppertal, which is a large industrial city in Germany in the rural, rural area, and our unit, because all the time we were in Germany, uh, we would almost lived in German houses or farms and so forth, because uh, all the civilians moved eastward with the army so that they got out of our way. They, uh, and the house that we lived in, <laughs> was the home of the president of the Kodak Company of, of Germany. <laughs> so it was it was rather plush living. <laughs> so finally uh, we we moved southward. I guess at that time we were relieved of, of most of our work in a pocket. Uh, and we ended up in Marburg, M-A-R-B-U-R-G, uh, a large area, a large city in mid-Germany, mid mid-Germany. Uh, and we had, we had facilities near a church there. 
it's a, it's a, a pretty city. It's a nice area. Uh, and off in the distance, you could see a, another small hill. And there was a, and found out that that was the headquarters for the SS. It was a training area and so forth, or headquarters for the SS. Um, and it was at that time uh, that we had, and I'm, I'm, I'm a little hazy on whether we were there and that moved down the castle. But anyway, uh, just about that time, uh, they had captured a concentration camp. It was at one of these work labor, labor, slave labor camps. But it's a concentration, concentration camp. Uh, and, do you remember the name of it? I, I do. I don't. I don't have it on my tongue, but I have it. Okay. Uh, and so uh, it was discovered that you know when they captured that there were a lot of very sick men in there that were so emaciated that they weren't even able to work. Uh, and so. We then went down with our ambulances to get these men out and get them to medical facilities. Uh, and for a period of time, two German female doctors were assisting us. And I have a picture of, of, the, of the two women uh, who were doctors who, who helped us. Uh, and I have pictures of the, of the actual concentration camp, too. I don't have pictures of inmates. Uh, I really didn't want to do this. I, <laughs> you, you don't have pictures of what? Of the inmates, the person to Well, so I I felt that, that uh, I don't know how they would have felt about it, but I just didn't want to be a part of taking pictures of, of their misery. Uh, I saw it, and that was enough for me. Uh, How did you feel about that? Oh, terrible. Just terrible. And, you know, then later on, when we came back to this country, and then the naysayers were saying there weren't any concentration camps. Uh, you know, I saw it. I was there. I evacuated. Uh, and the persons, he said that most of the persons that were so bad were TB patients. Uh, and later, uh, back in this country, uh, in 1980, I was diagnosed with hairy cell leukemia. Uh, and it was a rare, rare, rare form of leukemia. And at the time, they didn't have much hope. I lived more than five years. But during that period of time, they came up with, with some some cures, cures that were effective with the hidden cure, the hairy cell. Uh, and then towards the end of my five years, I had five years I could live, I think it was the fourth year or so, I developed tuberculosis. And, and sharing this story with, with doctors at the time, they suspected that what happened was that I picked up the germs for tuberculosis which is a very common situation. Many people walking around with germs of tuberculosis and never got it because their immune system was strong enough to overwhelm it. But when your, your immune system is threatened, then you're more exposed. And my white count was extremely low. In the hospital, I was isolated. No one could go into the room if, unless they were covered with white and then masks and so forth. Um, and so uh, they suspected what happened was I picked up the TV germ at that time in our evacuation of these men. Well, you beat those five years. <sighs> Pardon? You beat that five years. I did. I did. <laughs> I beat it. <laughs> so how you were talking about um, you took a lot of pictures, which is terrific. What kind of camera did you have with you? <laughs> I had a brownie, <laughs> <laughs> and I took a lot of my pictures with a brownie. It was a six twenty used six twenty or one twenty film. 
And one of on one of our when we were going across the German plains, uh, our troops captured a a a Kodak facility where they made film. So that we all got loads of film. <laughs> uh, and it was one of those pieces of I when I do it, I was I always carried a roll of film with me. I didn't always have my camera, but I had the film. <laughs> uh, and uh, I think maybe I told you the story about the shrapnel and the roll of film. Again, yeah. I'm not sure it was on camera. Uh, when we were when we were at Ramagan and we crossed over the bridge and we were in Ramagan, which was on the eastern side of the river, uh, they were every little while. German planes had come over trying to bomb that bridge. Uh, and so that we had a lot of activity during that time. Uh, many times our planes were able to come in and there would be a dogfight with the German planes. Uh, and so one night, I remember not one of the daytime, I was in a building with a friend of mine right there at the bridge site. And I don't remember whether we were being shelled by the Germans or whether by the planes, but I remember some, uh, an explosion that I was knocked down. I was at the window. And I think the Navy at that time was when this happened. Because later when I tried to take a little film out of my pocket, which was in my, my uh, jacket, uh, I'm left side in my pocket, I had a Jack of pockets. Uh, and I opened the box and I saw there was a, there was a, a rip in the box, the copper. So I covered the box. And it turned out that a piece of shrapnel had gone through my pocket, through the cardboard box, through the layers of film, and embedded in the, the wooden spool of it, of the pocket. Uh, I have no idea when it happened. These were many, many times that we were very close to shell, shelling. So it could have been any time. Uh, so after, after the concentration camp, we then moved to do a more, a, not rest, but the inactivity. And we moved up towards the, the Russian border. The Russians had come in and met the American forces at the Elbe River. Uh, so in the northern part of this pocket, uh, we were in Hofgeis Mar, H-O-F-G-E-I-S-M-A-R, Hofgeis Mar. Uh, and from there, I had a three-day pass to, to, to Paris. Uh, Right. So you're telling me about your three-day pass to Paris <laughs> <laughs> after you were in Hofgeismar. Uh, one of the things that I learned, uh, because when we were, once we had a pass, it went just it was a day pass to Brussels, apparently Belgium, uh, and I was with several guys, and uh, all they did was they went to a bar. Uh, all the interest in doing was, was either playing poker uh, <laughs> or, or drinking in a bar. And my whole pass was spent with these guys. And it was ridiculous. And so at that time I said, never again will I go with a group of GIs. <laughs> and so when I went out to Paris, I quickly set on my own schedule of what I wanted to see in those three days. And I really did an awful lot. <laughs> uh, we went to Versailles and saw the gardens there for Versailles. Uh, went to, you know, the Eiffel Tower, of course. Uh, and this, see, this was actually the war hadn't ended when we did, had this happen. Uh, it happened in May, I guess, the end of the war. And uh, I uh, 
who was a whole lot when I was in Paris, they were still celebrating their liberation from the Germans. And American troops could go right anywhere on the underground. Transportation was free to any American troops. Uh, and we just had a lot of privileges. Uh, and so I was able to go anywhere I wanted. So after I had Giesmar, uh, we heard that we were going to go up and be liber liberating. I mean, the troops, the occupation troops in Berlin. Now, to me, that this is going to be a deal. Because what, the 78th, no, the 70, where the 70th, the, I forget which paratroop group, paratroop uh, division there was, but they were, they were the occupying forces before we were. And then, so that we were then assigned Berlin. Uh, we went up by a, a motor convoy because Berlin is as we deeper into German and to Russian zone, and so that uh, we went by, by truck or by ambulance to our site in in Berlin, and again we were using facilities that were civilian 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 facilities, uh, and I had a. And I had pictures of it. We had a, I was a, a few of us had a very, very plush home. Uh, and uh, I, I considered uh, enrolling and in, in take a course at the University of Berlin. I remember that there were, it was going to be possible to do this. But they would have to sit in with their, their academic schedule. Uh, but I wasn't able to do that because our, my period of time there didn't coincide with it. Uh, it was, uh, by now, uh, when we went up the uh, the fraternization was, was lifted so that you could talk and communicate with, with German civilians. When was that? That was lifted? When this, was this was in October of 45. I was there in October, November, December, January, February, and March. I was there for about six months. And this was the best time of my whole army life. Uh, why was that? Why, why was that? Uh, because we had no responsibilities. <laughs> 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 it was just, uh, what the army did was, they said it made it possible for each company to have to set up a nightclub, uh, and someone in, in the company would be the, in charge of it. And a very close friend of mine, and I do remember his name because I, I do remember his name, Edmund Russo. Uh, he lived he lived in the house where we had this this nightclub. He hired a band. Uh, we paid dues to it, it was nominal amount, uh, and so, uh, so uh, it really was a very plush time. And I had a, a, a bad experience just before we were to come home. Uh, now, we were all sent home on the basis of points that we earned. You got points for how long every month you were in the army. Uh, if you got how many months overseas, uh, if you got any medals, you got a points for medals and so forth. And if you had a certain amount of medals, points, then you get shipped home. Uh, and in March, uh, I got word that I was going home. How'd that make you feel? Very good. Uh, although I was having such a good time, it wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't. There was no deprivation at that time. <laughs> um, and uh, a friend of mine, one night, I had gone to, the, to the, the nightclub and met a girl, and I was, and there was a curfew at the time for civilians. Every civilian had to be off the street at 11 o'clock at night. 
So I was taking her home, and uh, I saw later on a friend of mine who was also going home at this time with me. Uh, he was from Paul River, and I've forgotten his name, Fall, Fall River, Massachusetts. I, he was the nationality of, of Fall River was occupied, occupied. A lot of persons were immigrated from uh, Spain. I forget now. Anyway, it doesn't matter. So uh, I brought the girl home, and I'm I'm then coming back to my go back to my villa, which is some distance away. And I met my friend, and he said, "I said, he greeted me. What's going on?" He said, "I'm going down to the police station. I'm going to fix him." I said, "What do you mean?" He said, "I was going home with this girl, and it's after eleven o'clock, and they stopped." Her, they couldn't do anything with with him, and uh, they they took her down to the police station, uh, and so told me to go. He says, "I'm going to go back there. I'm going to fix him." I know I'm going to fix him. Turned out that he had a gun in his pocket, and I said, "Look, you're crazy, because you know we're going to get in trouble this way." Uh, yeah, I'm going to give me something with you. Uh, and uh, we're going home tomorrow. And you're going to jeopardize all of that? Because you want to fix these cops for what they did? Yes. So he is, he is bigger than I was. And uh, he had a gun. <laughs> and I kept pushing him. In the, uh, and he kept pushing me. And we're getting closer and closer. The PlayStation was down at this corner of the streets. And we get to the... Police station, and he's still he's still insisting that he's going to get into the police station and fix these guys. And he shows me his gun, and I said, "You're out of your mind. You're jeopardizing going home because of some girl who might have been slighted by the police." Didn't matter to him. Going to he gets the door open. We're going now. We're in the police station, and there was a long corridor leading down to the police station itself, the headquarters. And it was a small, narrow, not narrow, it was a two-person corridor, and there were a lot of glass windows in this corridor. Uh, and so, as I keep, keep insisting that you've you got to stop it, a jeep comes down the road, and it's the end police. The police obviously saw us coming, and they called the MPs. And I said, now look what you've done. Look, the MPs are here. Now it was serious business for him. He said, let's go, let's go, let's go. I said, give me the gun. He gave me the gun and I took it and put it on the bookshelf that was in this hallway. So out we go. I said, don't look. So we walked down, walked right down the street, going back to our billet. No, the police never spoke to us. <laughs> Nothing ever happened. <laughs> Oh, I got to go home. I got to go home. <laughs> and he got home too. <laughs> <laughs> oh. so, so how did you go home? How did they how did they get you home? Uh, we uh, we were assigned to a, a an ind ind an engineer division, an in division engineer company that was going to go and ship back. I don't know what the circumstances were. So we transferred this engineer, and we went to Antwerp, and, uh, and we sailed out from Antwerp. Uh, and as a crazy, I don't know why we did this, because we were up in northern Germany, Antwerp is up in there, and uh, the boat went by the Canary Islands, which is really in the in southern southern part of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, I don't know why, maybe the weather was conditions were such that they detoured the boat. Did you stop at the Canary Islands? No, we just went close enough so we could drive, went by and we could see them. Uh, while we were there, uh, while we were on the boat, uh, we were going to Antwerp. Uh, and uh, we were going to Antwerp. And we were going to Antwerp. And one of the forms in my collection of stuff is a, a yellow form, it's got punch holes. It's an eight and a half by eleven form, and on this form they recorded uh, 
all the skills that we had, either to save civilian life or in the army. And in there, they put on that I had gone to clerk school when I was in the picket. My basic training, I, I took a, took a series of courses on being a company clerk, uh, took typing and so forth. I already had some skills with typing, but it had, I improved my skills. Uh, and so they, they were in the, on the boat. They were in need of some clerical help because they were preparing all the forms so that when we landed, it'd all be done. And it would expedite the going home. So that one day an officer came and you, you were with us, I guess. He said, that you were clerk, what? I said, yes. So he typed, he says, yes, well, come with me. <laughs> so I spent most of the time on this boat typing forms. We had all sorts of orders, you know, typed the orders for the men to be shipped off from Fort Dix, where we were in the land, uh, and so forth. And um, it was rather extensive. And he was very appreciative of the, of the fact that I had admitted to it, agreed to it. And he took my, my, one of my forms, it's a white booklet, uh, and there's, every time you, you left a unit, they had an evaluation of you. And there was, I was in this unit, and so he gave an evaluation. He said, uh, he, so he wrote down, as he something evaluated me, it made, he wrote superior. It was all, all, all of my things were acceptable or you no know, no 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 but he was most appreciative of the kind of work that I did. And evidently there were other persons that there that I helped them do it. Do you remember his name? No. No. But that he signed it so I know so, it's, so, it, it's yeah. in a book. It's in a book. That's great. <laughs> okay. Well now we we we've got you home. Yeah. Are there any other um, stories that you wanted to tell me about the... the well, things in, in Berlin was just wonderful. Mm. Because uh, the German Philharmonic still is in existence, of course. Mm. And we we all could go to those free. Uh, and I remember we would go there and there would be German, I mean German, Russian, French, English soldiers or officers there were at this concert, uh, because at that time, we could go back and forth across the Russian zone, any of the zones, there was no problem at all. Uh, and so they came to these concerts too. So I, I never missed a concert. It was every other week there was a, a concert. And one night, they had a German, off, um, an American officer, who was a musician, who evidently had experience in training, and he conducted the orchestra. Uh, it's just it's just a wonderful time. Anything I could get my hands on that was going to improve my skills and my it was just wonderful. Um, and now, okay, we're back home. We're back home. Well, I just wanted to ask you some questions about um, not necessarily being back home, but kind of thinking of a little bit about. Um, you told me some of this, but a little bit about what just daily life was like for you when you were in the service. And you told me before that you stayed in touch with your family just by email, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And you said they they uh, they censored the, the mail. How, yeah. did, how did that work during the during the actual activity of the war before the uh, after the war? So we didn't have this, but an officer in our company was the censor. Mm -hmm. And so, uh -huh. all of us, we would not seal the letter. We would mail the letter, we did all the process, the stamps would be on so forth, wouldn't be sealed. We'd give it to the mail clerk, and then he would give to the officer all the mail that was going to go off, and then he would read it. How, how much he read it, I don't know. Uh, and I never asked my parents what the, what the letter looked like when it got there. Uh, but we were aware of what they were doing, what, what they were trying to caring about in terms of censorship, and so we were careful about not including that in our letters. Sure. So what was, the, what was the food like during the whole? Oh, another interesting thing happened with us, because we, 
When I went into the 78th, it was, oh, I forget how October it was. It was in 44. Uh, and we had a mess clerk, a mess sergeant, who was in charge of the, of the kitchen. Uh, so he directed all the activities. And we had, in the, when we were overseas, we had a lot of dehydrated stuff. We had dehydrated, dehydrated, dehydrated pet, uh, potatoes, uh, a variety of vegetables. So, uh, and and he prepared. He said it was not very good food. <laughs> and when we were in Berlin, this mess sergeant he he never had a lot of points because he left, and we got a new mess sergeant. Ah, we suddenly <laughs> learned how this food could taste. <laughs> he was good. He made, he took that dehydrated potatoes and he made the most tasty mashed potatoes. Right? <laughs> and we used to grouse about it and how, well, how many months, how many days we lived there. And that sergeant who didn't know what he was doing, he was probably a, a, an automobile clerk. <laughs> It was a joke in the army that, you know, the army never gave you the job that what you were doing in civilian life. <laughs> and that's what the assumption was about what this mess sergeant would do. <laughs> so you mentioned when people went on, like you said, when they took a day pass, they often go play poker or something. Yeah. What, what did you do when you were on base or wherever you were? Uh, you know, what did you do for entertainment? When the war was over, when the hostilities were over, um, and they said we had gone to the con this concentration camp, the war was still going on at that time, the hostilities were going on. Uh, but we had been relieved of our responsibilities in this pocket and gone down to Castle. Uh, so that uh, it would, you know, we, we would play ball. Uh, there was one time when we were in the, near the, the, the church and in the, in castle where we were able to go swimming. Uh, but that was very well infrequent. Yeah. Uh, but it's just a hanging out. Work. And we'd be able to go, we'd go walking in, in the city and so forth and look at sites. Uh, during, during the war, each time we train, changed, our company had to move somewhere to get, stay with the troops at the front. Uh, so we had a new location. And so the first thing that had to be done was we had to dig a latrine. <laughs> this was our toilet, because we never had flushing toilets. We dig a trench about a foot wide and about 10, 15 feet long and about three or four feet deep. And this was used as our latrine. And that had to be done, first thing. <laughs> uh, we all would have... I never had KP. How'd that happen? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how what happened. <laughs> well, they had some guys who were permanently assigned to it or that. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think now. What kinds of things did we do during the, or the during the hostilities? Another thing because we have had responsibilities, medical responsibilities. Was there something um, special that you did for good luck? I mean, did you ever feel like you, you know, was there something that either you did or that no. you had or anything like that for no. good luck? No. no. Um, so, did you uh, see any USO shows? Oh, yes, I see. What did you see? Um, once Jack Benny, mm -hmm. Alfred Adler, the harmonicus, and Ingrid Bergman came. Really? Yeah. Uh, and they, they, these were all attending, you know, they bring in the troops from all over the place. Uh, it's interesting because many years later, when I'm in New Haven, 
uh, we had a, I think had a concert at Yale. Alfred Adler. Alfred Adler? Did you see how hard it is? I, I think it was Alfred. He came, and I went up after the show to talk to him and told him about meeting him in Castle. So we reminisced about Castle. Uh, Were the shows really entertaining? Oh, yes, yeah. It was great shows. Is that like the highlight of the, the week or whatever? Oh, yeah, yeah. There weren't very many that we saw. I don't know that we saw anything after that. So where was that? That was in Castle? The, all of that them? was a Castle. So you didn't see any before that? No. Wow. You see, what, I, I believe what was happening during the war, actual war hostilities we weren't able to go anywhere because we had to have a pass to go. And we weren't getting passes during the hostilities, except for this one. So, uh, and it could be that, uh, you know, I know that uh, there were a lot of these shows, Bob Pope was going all over the place. I know it's all Bob Pope. So there are only, how many shows do you think you saw? Only one. Only that one? No. Um, do you recall, I mean, were there any um, in your company, where, did anybody pull any pranks? Pranks? Pranks. Did you or anybody else pull any pranks? Not that I know of. No, Not that I know. Nothing, nothing comes to mind? No. Even back in basic? Yeah. No, nothing? Okay. Yeah. Um, let's go back to basic training, because you told me you were, um, you must have had the, the regular, like, um, physical training, yes? Yeah. Yeah, so you had that. But you had no training for being a medic. I, I, I guess I had mentioned this before, that I realized afterwards, I was thinking back over it, what kind of train did I get? You know, uh, and you don't remember any? Nope. Nothing. What was your first, when you first, your very first time that you went out with your group, what? What did they? What did you have with you? What did they tell you? I had a, a, I had a khaki bag. It was about so wide and quite long. Uh, and in that we had a pair of scissors. <laughs> I still have my scissors. I still have. I have still have a bag and much of the stuff that I had because it came back with uh, sulfathiazole. Uh, so for no mic, which was an ointment, um, I had uh, morphine. We were a small capsule, about so long, about two inches long, uh, and a needle. I had a needle, and you take the needle off and give it uh, alcohol, uh, compress bandages, uh, which would be a big wound so you could stop the bleeding. And adhesive tape, of course, the small rules of the adhesive tape. Um, well, I had a lot of, a lot of smaller stuff like this. Uh, when I went to, uh, you know, oh, after we were in half these bars, something I did was, I remember that, uh, this is now in May, that uh, we're coming in the summer. And so I remember that I had hay fever. And I had a bad, uh, and I was getting shots for it in the United States. And so one day I'll go on sick call, go get some shots for my hay fever. Uh, and so I went to sick call and they said, well, we don't have those, so we have to send you back. Now this is at the clearing stations. See? So now we're going back to a field hospital. Uh, no, we don't have any shots up here, so you have to go back. I'm in Hofgiesbar, Germany, 
And he sent me all the way back to, uh, where was it? It was in, Paris, in France. Uh, I forget what it was. So I go in and, I, and now we go to see a doctor. Uh, I'm allergic to hay fever and I, I need shots. He says, uh, what is your exactly uh, uh, subject to it? I said, hay fever for ragweed. He said, well, good news for you, or bad news, is that there's no ragwood in, in Europe. Now, if you had ever looked at something that, that there is here, we had to set, send you back to the States. Oh. <laughs> I said, suddenly I feel it coming on. <laughs> he said, too late, too late. <laughs> So they put me on a train, sending me back to Hof Giesmar. I had come, I flew by, from this field hospital in Germany to this city in, in France, flew in there to get uh, hay fever shots. And he there's no hay, there's no red in Europe. <laughs> so you get so I get on this train and we're going back. And once again, they somehow, I must have had some records or something. Uh, so I got called to an officer. He, he said, uh, we're going back to Germany. The plane, this train's going to go all the way through and we're going to go to Frankfurt first. Uh, but we need to have so many charges of medical. Since you're the only medic on the train, you're going to be the doctor for the trip. <laughs> I said, I don't have anything. <laughs> I didn't. So fortunately, no one ever came up with anything. <laughs> no one got sick. <laughs> no one got sick. <laughs> but this was a beautiful trip. We, we went by train, and I wasn't at Cologne. It was a little south of Cologne. And the train then all the way down the Rhine River. It was the most beautiful thing. And uh, many of us were on, on these open flatbed Pirelli cars, so there's no no roof, nothing, and the sights are just beautiful, the, the castles and the, the, the countryside. Mm. So, what was your homecoming like when you finally came home? What was that like? Uh, it's interesting that I uh, I had and I had an idea about coming home and how I would do it. Uh, I wanted to come in from New York. And what happens is that anyone from Massachusetts and Connecticut will be discharged at Fort Devens, where we were taken, which was the closest one. And I said, well, that doesn't, that, that doesn't meet my plans. So since I was the one who was drawing the orders and sipping everybody, <laughs> <laughs> I wrote the order and I ordered, I ordered myself sent to Fort Dix. Then I would go by the train to, to, to New Haven, uh, to Springfield. <laughs> uh, and I think there was a f small privilege for, for the part I did, my superior work. <laughs> um, and so I did. I went to Fort, uh, Fort Dix and was there for a few days before we were finally discharged. Uh, and we. we and so I, I, what I did was I, I didn't want to arrive at night. I was decided I was going to write in the daytime. And so I <laughs> was discharged and I went to New York City and took the train at Grand Central and arrived in, in New Haven where I transferred to, to Springfield train. Uh, and so uh, I arrived, oh, it was probably 10, 11 o'clock in the morning. Uh, now, no one knew I was even in the, in the United States at this time. These things were all happening so fast. I may have called, I think I called Charlotte. Yeah. Uh, yes, I did. But uh, no one at home, Charlotte was up at Bates. This was in March. Uh, and so uh, I arrive at 10 o'clock in the morning, so I take the train to Springfield. Uh, and so I got off, off the train in the railroad station, 
and walked to to Steiger's. It's a hard. It's a. Uh, it was. I don't know if it still is. A department store in Springfield and. Uh, there, but. Diane, not Diane. Boy, my junkie. Uh, my my sister, Pat, Pat was working in in, in, in Steiger's. Uh -huh. She was decorating windows. She was a window designer. Uh, and so I went to there and I went to the information. And I said, and she, and he said, who, who are you? I said, I'm her brother. And just back from the, from the army. So they call her, and so she comes down there. She didn't even know I was in the country yet. <laughs> and so uh, it was a big surprise to her. Uh, and then I, just, I went home, and met the rest of the family. So it was a happy time. Yes, it was. Did they have a party for you? I don't remember what they did. <laughs> so what did you do in the in the days and weeks after after you got home? Oh, uh, I immediately made arrangements to start at Springfield College. Uh, the GI Bill of Rights is one of the best things that was ever done by the Congress. It was an investment in this in, the, in our country. The number of persons who went to college and got college degrees out of the GI Bill, one of the, as I said, one of the best things that Congress ever did. Um, and I went to Springfield because I, when I was in high school, I had trouble uh, with a foreign language. Uh, and I, very carefully avoided taking a foreign language. But most colleges at the time required that, that you had to have a foreign language. Springfield College was one of the few that did not require it. Uh, and so what I did was I, I, I Phil Brew, uh, I knew quite well, Phil was also a graduate at Springfield, and he uh, so he said, well, what you've got to do is you've got to take a placement test. So I went out to the, the college and took my test. And I scored so high that, that, that there was no need for me to take anything. That I, everything else, what I did was I had made as electives in high school. I took all the, the uh, science courses I had to take. I had physics. I had uh, geometry. I had algebra. I had all the prerequisites for college except the foreign language. Uh, and so I got accepted uh, that September. Uh, this was in, by now April, May. Uh, and I learned later on that what happened was that the, a lot of soldiers came back and wanted to go to college. Their, acted, their scores at college, academic record wasn't very impressive. And so they set up uh, temp summer programs that summer that would be that would be test their test their skills in certain areas, and if they passed it, that they could then enter in the September incoming class. I didn't have to do that, um, but what actually happened at Springfield as a result of it, there were two groups in their freshman class. There were those that all had to go through this <laughs> summer program, summer program. Uh, and so there was a real camaraderie with these people. Then there were those, those who didn't, it came in September, so that there were two actual groups. Uh, so that, and also, I really didn't have much confidence in myself. I didn't, I didn't think I was going to, I was thought I was going to have a hard time. Uh, and I just devised a way of how, how I was going to take my courses and how I was going to stay current and so forth. And I remember the first marking period, I, I we were line, we got our records and so forth. We got a folder and on my folder my, was an F. Like, oh no, I got an F. What did I get an F in? Um, it turned out it wasn't an F, it was for, 
a group that I was in. Okay. <laughs> it's my group number. <laughs> uh, so you went to college, and then um, after you went to college, um, what did you do as your with you as a career? Uh, well, uh, my idea was that, that I would go in the YMCA, uh, and so I took social worker courses, uh, and there were courses that the YMCA wanted me to take, and so forth. And so this is what I did was I did this. Now, when I was finishing up my senior year, uh, I realized that I had time left over, and I had enough time to do my graduate degree, too. And so I signed up to do my graduate degree, and I signed up for um, psychology, and I got the master's. Uh, and I started, and my first job was with the YMCA in New Haven, Connecticut. And that's how I came to New Haven in 1951. All right. So, um, let me ask you if you made any close friendships in the service, and if you kept any of those relationships. Edmund Russo, that I mentioned before, he one time came, called me, and we were communicating with each other. He lived in New York at the time, uh, and so he and his wife came down to visit us in Springfield. Uh, I remember. He was East Catholic, was Roman Catholic. I and uh, he said that where's my church closest church? Because it was there for the weekend. Uh, and so I told him, he said, Well, I have we have a cathedral here. He said, Oh yeah. He told me later that he didn't believe me because the cathedral is only a place that the seat of the of the bishop. Uh, and so he went to the cathedral at Springfield. And it was a cathedral. <laughs> so, Ed Russo was really the only one that I had any contact with after that. Uh, because the 78th Division is not a division that, was, that came from, like the 26th Division is a group from New Haven. I was a group from uh, New England. Uh, and uh, many divisions were founded in you were made up of, of uh, National Guards and so forth. But 78th was a, had men from all over the country. I had friends that were from, from Texas, uh, so that, and lots from Pennsylvania, uh, so that there were different countries. And so Ed was really the only one that I really had a kind of close contact with. So. Did you, after the war, did you join any veteran organizations? Yes. Well, here in New Haven, a friend of mine in New Haven, uh, another peace, peacenik, uh, we joined, we started a chapter of the Veterans for Peace. Uh, this was an organization that was started by someone uh, in the late 60s who, his the man who founded the Veterans of Peace, his brother had been killed in Vietnam, possibly. And so he set up this Veterans for Peace uh, with the idea of that this organization is going to work for peace. Uh, and so we set up the, our chapter here. We had to have 10 men to start the chapter, and we Usually found ten men were all you have to do is have been in the army, the navy, the marines, a military organization. Uh, and so we established chapter thirty-three, which is right now there's well over hundreds of chapters all over the country. So are you still active in that? Well, my medical conditions right now prevent me from being. Uh, so many from the national board called me. And he wanted to get us that more active in Connecticut because all the chapters that had been formed in Connecticut had become inactive. Uh, we, when I was president at Children's for Peace, 
we had two we had two state conventions here, which was all unusual. Uh, so all the chapters from the Connecticut were invited to this, and we had a program for a full day. So that, uh, and I so I have my act my activities now are really limited because of my physical condition. Well, how how did your military experience influence your thinking about war or the military in general? Well, <laughs> a big question. Well, it certainly didn't. It didn't make me less a pacifist. No, I, I, I still consider myself a pacifist, and uh, I met a variety of people who who have are active in the veterans of peace. That are, some of them are pacifists, not all of them are. Uh, and so, my army experiences just, I think, made me solidified my feelings about being a pacifist. Well, is is there anything we do have to talk about? So is there anything else you'd like to add that we haven't covered in this interview? Oh, I'm sure I'll think of a whole <laughs> bunch of things. <laughs> well, for now then, um, I guess we can close. And okay. I would like to thank you for your service and for taking the time to be interviewed. Well, thank you very much. I'm glad, I'm glad to participate. Glad to participate. <laughs>